Conjectures can be produced using inductive reasoning, but in order to prove a conjecture, we need to move to deductive reasoning. A proof is something where there is no counterexample. So with inductive reasoning, there could potentially be an example out there that would disprove a conjecture, not the case with deductive reasoning. So it's a way of showing that your conjecture is true in all cases, there is no counterexample out there. And with deductive reasoning, we're going to begin with a general statement and then move to something very specific. So it's the reverse process of what we do with inductive reasoning. A generalization is something that has broad implications. So we start with something fairly general and then we move it to something that is very specific. One thing we're going to utilize quite a bit is the transitive property, which we touched on a little bit when we looked at trigonometric proofs. The transitive property states that if two quantities are equal to the same quantity, therefore they must be equal to each other. So for example, if A is equal to B, and b is equal to c, well, both of these statements have the same variable b. So if both of them are equal to b, we can say therefore a must be equal to c. If reasoning is required to prove a conjecture, it's often gonna be set up using algebra. Algebraically, we can choose any variable to represent a number. I went with the variable n for number. So let's say that n happens to be five. If I want to represent the previous number, the number that comes before, we know that four comes before five. So you want to ask yourself, what are we doing with five to get down to four? Well, we know we are subtracting one. So the previous number can be represented by starting with n and removing one from it. If we want to show consecutive numbers, consecutive numbers are one number that comes after another. So let's say n is 5, 6 is the next consecutive. If n is negative 3, negative 2 is the next consecutive, and so on. So in order to get to the next consecutive number, again, you're going to start with the number n, and we're going to add 1 to it to get to the next consecutive. In terms of an even number, think about your even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc., all of your even numbers are divisible by two. You cannot just use n to represent an even number because let's say n is five, five's not even. So an even number, because it's divisible by two, you have to make sure that you multiply that variable by two to guarantee that it's going to be even. We know the odd numbers are one, three, five, seven, etc. So between every even number is an odd number. If we start with something even, we can either add one or subtract one to get to an odd number. Or we could add three, we could subtract three to get to an odd number. So when we go to represent the odd numbers algebraically, we're going to start with something even, and we're going to add one to it, or we're going to subtract one from it. We're going to add three, or we're going to subtract three. There's a few different ways you can go about this, but in each of these cases, we have to begin with something even, and then we're either adding or subtracting an odd number to that even number to produce something odd. Now remember, with deductive reasoning, we're starting with general statements and we're moving to a specific conclusion. We're going to begin with a non-algebraic example. And in this first question, we're asked to produce a Venn diagram. So we know a Venn diagram is a way to represent the comparison of different items. And there's more than one way you can draw it. So in this particular case, our first statement, and again, it's a general statement, is all dogs are mammals. Well, we know mammals have hair, they're warm-blooded, the mother usually produces milk, uh, they have a vertebrae, etc. So I'm going to start by drawing my dog circle, and then around that is my mammal circle. Now there are other types of mammals we could also include in that mammal circle. So we know we could have cats, elephants, humans, tigers, etc. Dogs is just one category of mammals. And then our next statement says all mammals are vertebrates. So I'm going to put my mammal category into the vertebrae category. I'm going to draw my vertebrates around there. Into the vertebrae category, anything with a backbone, we could also have fish, birds, amphibians, reptiles. Mammals is just one type of vertebrae. And then our final statement says Shaggy is a dog. Well, here's my dog circle. So we're going to plunk Shaggy into the dog circle. And then we have to come up with a conclusion about Shaggy. By referring to our diagram, we can see that if Shaggy is a dog, Shaggy will also be a mammal and Shaggy will have a vertebrae.
We're going to do a little party trick here you can amaze your friends with at your next gathering. I'm going to get you to grab your calculator and into your calculator you're going to enter any positive number. You can do this mentally if you want. Um, it might be easier to keep track of it on a calculator though. You're going to multiply by 3 and press equals. Subtract 2, press equals. Add 8, press equals. Divide by 3, press equals and subtract whatever the original number was and press equals and what answer did you come up with? I ended up with the number two. You, you got number two as well? Check with a friend. Did they get number two? Try it on your parents. Did they get number two? No matter what number we start with originally, it appears as though we're going to come up with two. This is an example of inductive reasoning where we can check or we can even try ourselves several different numbers and we're going to see that each time we get an answer of two. This is a pattern that we're noticing, but it's not a proof. There could be a number out there that when we follow these steps, we don't end up with two as a final answer. Let's try to set this up deductively. My positive number, I chose n to represent that value. We're going to triple it. We're going to multiply by 3. From that statement, we're going to subtract 2, and then we're going to add 8. Now, you do have like terms here you need to combine. So negative 2 plus 8 gives me positive 6. We're going to divide that entire statement by 3. So remember, you have to divide each term by 3. So 3n divided by n leaves me with 1n, and then 6 divided by 3 gives me 2. And then from that statement, we're going to subtract our original number, which we represented with that n. So again, I'm going to combine my like terms n minus n is 0n, and we are left with 2. This deductive proof shows me that no matter what I put in here for the value of n, I will always come out with 2. I'm actually going to go back and clarify that the number that you entered would have had to have been a whole number to come out with the value of 2. If you enter a whole number in here and follow these steps, your answer, my answer, our friend's answers would have all been 2. So we may have come up with a conjecture that the answer will always be 2, but there could have been a number out there, potentially, that when we substituted it in and followed these uh, procedures, we did not get 2. So inductive reasoning supports our conjecture. We could have come up with a few more examples to show that we're getting to, but it's not a proof. When we resort to deductive reasoning, now when we've gone through algebraically, we can see that it doesn't matter what I substitute in for n. If I put a whole number in for the value of n, I am guaranteed to get 2 as an answer. We've shown that that will always be the case. Therefore, deductive reasoning is much stronger than inductive reasoning. It's the only way we can prove something. Anytime we see the word prove, we know that means we have to use deductive reasoning. Again, look for an operation word. Sum we know is addition, and we are adding together two even integers, and we're trying to prove that when we do that, the sum is always even. The first thing you need to do is get this set up. I'm going to use 2n to represent that first even integer, and then I'm going to add to it another even integer. And I don't want to use an m again, an n again, because it doesn't say that I'm adding a number by the same number. So I'm going to show that this is two potentially different even integers. And then what you're going to do is take a look, what's our goal? So we're trying to prove in this case that we end up with something even. You need to follow what you know about algebraic processes in order to try to get something that's even. I can't combine these two together because they're not like terms. So if something's even, I know that it's going to be a number that I'm multiplying 2 by. So think about everything you know in mathematics and try to get it into what we're trying to show. I can factor out a 2. So if I factor out a 2, I'm going to be left with n plus m. This 2 is going to make it even, that sum. It doesn't matter what I have in here. I'm going to add any two numbers together, but as soon as I multiply by 2, that sum becomes even. In our final example, again we're asked to prove something, which we know means we're going to use deductive reasoning. In this case, product means multiplication. So we're going to set up, we're multiplying an even integer, which I represented with my 2n, times an odd integer, which I chose to represent as 2n plus 1. We need to show that our product is even, so 2 or some kind of even number times something else. I'm going to get you to pause this and I want you to try to do that and then you can come back here. 
because we're multiplying a monomial times a binomial, I know I need to distribute this in to get rid of the brackets. So I do that and I end up with 4n squared plus 2n. Now again, always go back to your goal. We want to show that it's even. So I can factor a 2 out of both of these terms. So I just happen to pull out the greatest common factor. When I do that, I'm going to get some kind of a number in my bracket. In this case, it will be an odd number. I'm going to multiply it by something else. But then as soon as I multiply this whole piece by 2, I know that when I multiply by 2, it becomes even. So I've now proven that this answer will become an even number.